but you would spend a lot of money to do so. So uh, you've got it, your, your addressing lines. You've got a, uh, what I'm going to call a scan-out engine for the purposes of this talk. Uh, Render refers to it as a CRTC, which is technically wrong for a couple reasons, but also doesn't sound as good. Um, your scan-out engine can only ever go so big. A uh, single link of DVI, which is the standard digital, digital connector right now, has a limit of how fast, literally how many pixels per second it can push out. And if you do the math at 60 frames a second and 165 megahertz, your, the biggest picture you could put out there is about 1920 by 1200, which is why every single LCD maxes out at 1920 by 12. You can't fit more on the wire. But that scanout engine has to go walk through memory and pick pixels out of memory and try to, to and get them into this in, into DVI signaling format and get them out into the world. So as it's addressing through memory, it's generating these memory cycles, it says, well, there's clearly no reason for me to ever need to address more than two kilopixels wide because I can only feed a single link of DVI, and that's never going to get wider than 1920. So, okay, I'll only put 11 address lines in, and so the, the block of memory that the scanner engine is pointed at can only get two kilopixels wide. If you try to do something wider than that, uh, it, it just looks like garbage. Similar arguments apply for the hardware accelerated rendering. Uh, the 2D engine and the 3D engine inside the chip have coordinate limits for exactly the same reason. There's no reason to make them much more capable than you can scan out because you couldn't see that image anyway. So why would you bother drawing it? Um, the great thing is that all of these are essentially arbitrary. Often they're the same depending on the different subsystems of the chip, and sometimes they're not. Um, the 2D engine might have a different, uh, different limit than the 3D engine. Either of those could be different than the scan-out engine. The 2D and 3D engine can have different output, can have different coordinate address limits depending on whether it's on the input side or the output side. You might be able to source from a four kilopixel wide texture, but only get to one, only draw to something that's two kilopixels wide. Um, tiled versus linear uh, depends on the layout of the pixels in the frame buffer. Just show of hands, who knows what I mean when I say tiled? Okay, for the ones that don't uh, think of a normal a normal frame buffer as just row of pixels over and over and over, and as you walk off the right edge, you restart at the left edge. Um, tiling is a trick to make them more spatially, to make spatially local what's temporally local. So imagine a checkerboard, and you go eight pixels across, you restart at the ninth, the ninth pixel is then one down from the, the one you started at, you fill in this checkerboard, and then you move one checkerboard to the left. Um, this is actually really useful when you've got a pixel cache in the way because now things that are local on your screen, like icons, are local in memory. Um, depending on whether your frame buffer is in tiled or linear format, you might have different coordinate limits for what you can do. The Radeon R500 can scan out up to 8 kilopixels wide if it's linear, but up to 3,968 pixels if it's tiled. Not 4K. I, I don't know why. I have a suspicion, but I don't know why. And sometimes they're just weird. Um, the early Matrox cards had a, had a coordinate limit on only the digital output route, where it could only go up to 1280 by 1024, because it was cheap. So the problem that this then causes is you have one root window PIX map. That's where all your pixels have to go, which means that it can't ever get bigger than what you want to do with it. And if what you want to do with it is scan it out to the hardware, make it show up through these projectors, it's limited to what the output engine can do. And if you've only got one of them, and your scan out engine can only stride up to two kilopixels wide, then the whole thing has to be two kilopixels wide. And that means that if you wanted a second monitor to the left of it, it's got to fit in that same two kilo. That's not the greatest thing in the world. That monitor right there is, is 1400 by 1050. These are running at 1024 by 768. I couldn't possibly fit them next to each other because 1400 plus 1000 is bigger than 2048, which is all that that hardware can do. 
So multi-head doesn't actually work. You have these arbitrary limits that come in and break, your, break these assumptions. You want to be able to just plug it in and have it go. But we can't because you only have one root window pixel map. We also, as a side effect of lots of horrible history, we size that pixel map once at server startup because you don't want to waste memory. If you have a unified memory architecture like the Intel chips, then any memory that you allocate to the frame buffer, you can no longer use for system memory. So you'd like to minimize this. I'm assuming that this is getting fixed by other people. Thank you. Um, and we clamp, so this big allocation that we have for the root window picks map, we clamp more or less arbitrarily to try to fit into all these constraints and hopefully it works. Um, occasionally it's broken anyway, or it gives you really weird behavior when you do. Um, the Radeon I mentioned earlier is a good example of this. If you try to set up two 30-inch monitors next to each other, that ends up being five kilopixels wide, but accelerated rendering stops at four kilopixels. Right. And so what happens is you can do accelerated rendering to all your off-screen pix maps that so, because they're all small enough, but then when you try to copy from them into the front buffer, the, accelerating, the accelerator can't do it, so we fall back to the CPU and then we end up doing lots of bus reads, pulling pixels out, doing nothing to them, and putting them right back up. It's incredibly slow. And it's sitting on my desk at work. So we would like this to be better. So shatter is this idea that I've been working on for a while and that doesn't work, but is pretty close where you can have multiple root window pix maps or any other pix map. Ideally, I mean, imagine you have a big 8 kilopixel off-screen surface that you want to render to, and then you're going to buy one or downscale it down to make it look shiny and then put it on the screen. Um, you can size them whenever you like based on, you know, assuming you've got a memory manager that actually lets this work. Uh, you can clamp them according to what the hardware constraints that you're working within are, but in principle, you're never going to notice. All of this just magically works for you and it looks fast. So the idea here is the root window no longer has real storage. And as rendering comes in from clients, you get down to the bottom layer where you're just about to do rendering and you say, wait a second, that's not a real pix map, it's a virtual pix map. I'm going to go look up this list of real pix maps that are backing it and send the same rendering back down to each one of them and do the appropriate translation and clipping to make sure that that works. And then from the user's perspective, you'll just never know the difference because you'll see both of them. And as an advantage, your laptop will work. Hooray. So X has approximately four rendering APIs at this point in time. Um, we'll refer to them as Core X, which is the things that the core protocol defined back almost before I was born. Uh, render, which is a, a 2D anti-alias uh, alpha-enabled composition API, XV, which lets you do video, and OpenGL, which lets you do 3D. Core X is awful, but you have to keep it working because you did promise to be an X server. So those requests have to work. There are some ugly geometry primitives that you can use in Core X. You can do solid fills. You can do arcs that are aliased around the edges with really big steps and it looks nasty. You can draw lines, you can draw polygons with winding rules, you can draw alias text. All of these are really straightforward to shatter because all you have to do as the request comes in is take a copy of all the arguments and translate them relative to the, the logical screen coordinates and clip and draw. So sweet, this should be, this should be straightforward, right? If, if, the, if the bad parts are this easy, then the, then the good parts of X should be just as easy, right? It'll be fine. Um, you need to take a little care when you're doing the geometry primitives just because of the way the X server is written. Um, when you get a, a polyline request passed in, the renderer assumes that it has the right to modify those bits uh, to say, you know, here's where the line starts and here's where the line ends. And we do, in fact, do this. So you have to copy it aside before you hand it down to each one of these backing pix maps. But it's mem copy. We know how to do that. Copy area is where it starts to get hard. Um, imagine you've got four screens like this, and you're going from, you've got a window over top of them that's your blue rectangle, and you want to copy it into the green rectangle. Um, but 
that's where all your bits are. So you have to be very careful about doing this and the, walking these in the correct order to make sure that you don't clobber some of the bits that you're going to try to copy out later. If I started copying from here, you know, find all the bits in this pix map and try to copy them out, then I would copy down to the right, and I would, this little strip would end up here, but now the pixels that were there are gone. So I've lost data, so I can't do it. So you have to be careful to start walking these in the reverse order. You find out which one's the, the more axis major direction, walk it in that order first, and then the other order second, which means you have to write, essentially, a four arguments greater than or equals, which is pretty straightforward, but you can do it. The root window, it doesn't, but you would really like to, the, the question was, does the, uh, does the protocol guarantee that the root window is lossless, that pixels that you put there stay there? And the answer is no. Uh, it, is a, it is a completely legal move to take all rendering that happens to the root window and throw it away. That's fine. That's the problem, with, but we know what the problem is with generating expose events. They are incredibly slow. I mean, it's the same reason that when you VT switch back onto your X server, you get a quick paint of some stuff, and then pop, 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 things come back in. And that's because you keep having the context switch back in and out, say, think of the region that you want to expose, send the exposure event, have the application think for a minute, remember what it put there, and send it back. You'd really like to avoid that. It's bad enough as it is. So yeah, we could just blow the bits away. You could do the easy bits, I was thinking, with that state with the more bits map. Right. The one that right. Yeah, the, yeah, I think I've got this right now. Uh, there are cases actually where the Zenorama code will do that, which does something similar. Um, this is all operating within one screen, which you can think of as one GPU. And the Zenorama code is wretched, so every once in a while it gets this wrong and generates exposures. But, okay, so you can, this you think you can do, but because you've got two arguments involved, you have, to, and they, can, they both point to real pixels, you have to be careful about how you walk them. The image primitives in X are not used that often. I'm using get image for an example, but put image has the same problem. I apologize for putting code into the presentation, especially function pointer type defs with camel casing X, really. Um, so get image takes as its argument a drawable, the box that you want to grab, the format, which you don't care about, the plane mask, which is negative one, and the destination, which is, some bits, wh which is the bits that you want to send back to the client. The client has asked now for a screenshot. It's trying to get the image off the screen, and you have to get the bits back to it. Well, so now I've got this window spanning two shards. Shards are the notional term I've been using for the backing pix maps. It's a lot quicker to say. Shatter, you're breaking it into lots of pieces. Shards, the pieces. Um, so as you walk over this pix map and you say, okay, I need to grab this piece from this shard and the right piece from the right shard. Well, if you send the get image request to the left screen as is, you're going to run off the right of the edge of the pix map, miss, and then keep filling in the rest of the bits, and those will all just go into dest into the into the the byte buffer, out, uh, the output buffer, more or less correctly. Um, when you get here, though, you're going to translate this against the left screen. It has no way of knowing what the stride is, right? You're going to grab this bit of pixels and this bit of pixels and this bit of pixels off the left, and they're just going to go packed in right after each other. So you can't. The function, point, the function pointer, the, the parameter, just doesn't have enough arguments to describe this, this stride, to say, stop here, skip the next however many pixels, and restart, and put the, put the output bits there. So you can do it, but you have to change all the colors of get image and put image to do this. Um, it's workable. It's, it, the other thing you could do is you could generate a lot of get image or put image requests to each backend screen and say, all right, well, I know I got this big request up front, but I'm only going to put this span and then the one below it and then the one below it and then the one below it and just yeah, walk so down. When you say reassemble.
for get image. Yeah, you could. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, typically we don't ever have the case where one screen of a GPU will be planar and one will be packed, or where one will be RGB and the other will be BGR. Okay. <laughs> I have a lot of bizarre hardware. I don't know of any where we do that. You could. It, it would be foolish. And there's no reason to do that. It's, it's much, I think it's easier to just add a stride argument and step it, because you have to anyway. There's already a stride argument implicit in how this works, because the the right the right edge of pixel storage is always ragged for alignment reasons so there's already a stride that you have to accept so i think it just makes sense to just add another argument and then you, you still have to do basic right so the point there was um if the root image that you're trying to get is bigger than your blit engine can handle, you still have to do manual walking. Uh, yes, but remember that we've tried to create these shards such that they're only big enough that the 2D engine can't handle them. But yeah, you could have fallen back to software like we usually do for Git image. So, not that big a deal. And then there's all the other details. Um, Tiles are this awful thing in the X protocol, in the in Core X protocol, that lets you say, "Yeah, I said I wanted to do a solid fill, but rather than solid filling with you know just a color, I want to do uh, this little tile pix map." If you remember uh, on old Macs or Windows 3.1, the background editor that lets you light up individual pixels, that um, and make this little tile pattern that then checkerboards across the background. Yeah, tiles exist. In principle, the tile can also be really, really huge, bigger than your engine than your acceleration engine can do. So, you can specify tile offset, but if the if it's bigger than your acceleration engine can stride, then it doesn't matter. Then you have to chunk it up into lots of little pieces. So, yeah, you'd have to handle tiles this way too. Stipples are. A similar concept, bitmap in X means a pix map with one bit per pixel. It's literally just one, it's a monochrome image. And stipples are, you can think of them as a mask on the rendering that you're doing. You want to say, where this pixel is one, rendering happens. Where it's zero, nothing happens. Again, the stipple could be way too big. Okay, I'm going to pretend that that never happens for the moment. But if it did, you'd have to handle it. Um, we also have these things internal to the X server called get, set, and fill spans that are not protocol rendering requests. They're not something that the client can directly ask for, but we do have a way of decomposing anything that the client could ask for into these requests. Um, on old hardware, it used to be very easy to get a very small aperture, you know, 64K of VGA aperture space or something like this, or 16 bytes at a time of not really memory mapped uh, video memory. And so it was easy to just, you know, do one span at a time and let everything else handle decomposing that into span at a time. They don't happen that much anymore, but they can. And so you have to also handle the spans target. They're not that hard to to chunk up into, re into multiple requests because it's just a span, a horizontal span at a time. You've already accepted it's going to be slow, but you have to handle them. Push pixels is this other rendering request inside the X server that you can't really get to from the client. It's basically like having a second stipple, where you have one stipple that represents the the cursor image and one rep one that represents the outline of the cursor. And this is literally what's used for is for software monochrome cursors. In principle, now you have two stipples that could be really really large, but you know what? Uh. -uh don't have a software cursor that large. I don't care. Yeah, we more or less do anyway. Um, generally, when these happen right now, they just fall back to software as it is. Um, but we like everything to go fast. So if you can make it so that, every, that you avoid these paths or that they work correctly if you happen to accelerate them, lovely. 
but most of these don't actually matter. You can bring up GNOME without this, so that's nice. Render is probably my least favorite rendering API ever. Uh, I've stolen one of uh, one of Carl's slides from ages ago and, and rotated the color so that it shows up. But this is basically what Render lets you do. Render lets you take a source image, happens to be a solid color here, and you in that with a mask, which is now this full alpha uh, channel, eight bits of alpha that lets you specify transparency. So where every side you're everywhere you're inside the mask, you kind of cookie cutter that out, and then paint it onto the destination according to some blend mode that's all the possible ways that you can use alpha factors to combine pixels from the source and the destination. Great. Ternary operations. Three things that you have to walk and that could all be bigger than, that could all be split up into multiple shards, so if you cross shard boundaries you need to make sure you hit all of them. Okay, we can do that. Um, it's pretty straightforward except for the cases I'm going to talk about in a second, where, it, you know, as long as they're all untransformed and straight and just kind of going straight through, then it's all easy. There are some geometry primitives that come along with render that lets you, uh, basically makes it easy ways to build masks. So you can do trapezoid and triangle rendering and build up this mask that contains the outline of the thing that you want to draw and then blend that with your image and, you know, cookie cutter that with your image and blend it through. Those are pretty straightforward to chunk up into bits, the same way you did with the Corex rendering primitives. There's also a glyph cache that lets you upload a single shared copy of a font with all the glyphs pre-rasterized at a given size and share that among multiple programs so that you don't have one instance of it for every process, every GNOME terminal process, every, uh, every Firefox process. Um, this is okay as well because the glyph cache ends up usually being sufficiently small, it's only the one pix map. Um, but when you do glyph operations, when you pull from that glyph cache and use them as the masks that you use to draw fonts, then you have to be prepared for the destination may be shattered, may be broken up. So you have to walk over that too. Oh wait, all the other things that are wrong with render. Yeah, it's a centery operation. It has six operands. You can, there's this feature in, in, uh, in render that lets you specify the alpha channel of a picture independently from the color channels. So I don't think they're even required to be the same size. Which I don't know what really what that would mean, but you could have now these six masks that you have to walk in, six pictures that you have to walk in parallel, making sure that they're all chunked up correctly. I actually had to look up what the word was for take six arguments because I wanted to use it. Um, the source and the mask operands in the, last, in the last slide are allowed to be transformed. And this is where it gets really nasty. Uh, when, the, when I say transformed, I mean you can think of it as deforming it. You're rotating it or you're, you're doing a perspective skew on it or something like this. So now it's not just a simple matter of figuring out where that fits on the screen. It's not just, you know, I'm pasting this image straight down. It's, oh, this pixel, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to draw this pixel here and, but it's a, of a warped image. It's, you know, Shadow Man's been twisted a bit and he's got, this pixel corresponds to, uh, on the output corresponds to this pixel on the input. You have to invert the transformation and make sure that you walk each of the source pictures according to their clip in the pre-transformed space. Oh, and you have to do that for both the source and mask, and the source's external alpha, and the mask's external alpha. Right, so filters is, is now where this gets really awesome, because uh, once you transform them, you can specify how you're going to get the samples. You, you've transformed this picture. They are required to be uh, a fiend, which is, which is fortunate. Yes. Um, but now, once your once your filters are transformed, um, when sorry, once you're transformed and you have filters, if your filter is nearest neighbor, then you just pick the coordinate in the back in the mask that happens to match most exactly to the inverse of the transformation. If your filter is bilinear, which is you know what you get when you do uh, resizing in Firefox, then it has to sample between the four nearest neighbors and pick proportionally what they're all going to be. 
what do you think happens when you reach the edge of a shard? Now you have this strip that you have to go walk over very carefully and compute. Um, basically, you have to truncate everything to just within the the width of uh, to the, within the current the uh, convolution kernel width of the filter and do that. Do it over that exactly. I did make it so that. Um, the the copy area walk code that I meant that I uh, that I was talking about earlier I I did make it so that that would work correctly if multiple shards overlapped and like occupy the same pixels. Uh, this is why it ends up being a, a quaternary operation because you have to look at all the boxes and pick the outside edge of whichever direction you're going. Um, so yeah, you could. I'm not really sure how to do that. It's not it's difficult to say how that would work in the case where. Um, where one of the shards is the buffer that you're scanning out because then you'd have this sort of off-screen tickle that you don't see but that is in the same picture. I don't know. It would require a little bit of, of hand-waving. You could probably do it though. Oh, and then there's dithers, which fortunately the protocol specifies but nothing implements because otherwise they'd be really hard for exactly the same reasons. You'd have to rotate the, you'd have to rotate the dither mask to figure out where you are in the dither according to where you are in the real output, not where you are in the shard that's got the, those virtualized pixels. So, uh, a lot of boring typing. You can do it, but you really hate yourself afterwards. Uh, XV in, in some sense is a lot nicer. Um, you already have these arbitrary, you already have some, some coordinate constraints brought in by XV because your overlay hardware actually says, no, I can't take anything bigger than two kilopixels wide. Um, people tend to get angry about that, though. And if you want to have, you know, four monitors in a, in a square and have one video image going to all of them because you're building a display wall or something, then you have to come up with this software version or, or just use the YUV texture support rather than the, hard, than the YUV overlay support in the chip to do really big images that way. So the model is sort of weird for XV, so I'm, I wrote down all the words. Screens have adapters. Adapters are the overlay, the, the video overlay, or the texture engine in the, three, the, the texture bit of the 3D engine, which lets you do uh, YUV textures. Adapters have ports, which is essentially the number of times you can connect to it. Your hardware overlay only has one. Uh, texture adapters typically have as many as you want because it's just up to the, the device to software manage that. And they have formats, which is what kind of video data you're sending it. Is it RGB? Is it YUV? If it's YUV, which of the 40 types of YUV is it? Is it CMYK? Is it MISC or other? Um, so I think that the trick here, and I haven't actually gotten around to doing most of this yet, is uh, just expose a new adapter type that virtualizes the whole thing and says, if you do this, I promise I'll do the best I can. And then if everything fits on one screen and the image that you're trying to put is within the coordinate limits, it'll use the overlay and you'll get uh, really pretty upscaling and everything else that goes along with that. Yeah, you know how that is. You know where the image is going. The question is, do it automatically? Applications really can't get it wrong in this sense because we're the ones in control of the clip list. Their end player is not going to say, I want, I, you know, I'm at plus 100, plus 100, and I'm 100 pixels wide, and therefore I want all of my pixels at plus 1,000. It's going to put the picture inside its window. It's going to put the YV image inside its window. So you know when you're entirely on one CRTC. Sure, we might know when we read it. You can get this right and just have applications not have to care. And then if it gets too big for the overlay or it crosses CRTC boundaries, then you split it up and use the texture engine. Yeah, okay, you can do it. Uh, it's essentially no more complicated than the put image case I described earlier. There's also a get image path for this. Did you know that X can be used as a video capture API? Please don't. We do actually have a driver to do it. There's the, the, V4, the V4L driver will let you do this kind of capture. Um, yeah, you can fix that too. You can actually use that on, uh, on uh, um, work applications. You can actually set your, uh, your XV to source instead of a camera if you use the V4L interface. 
can can you not have said that? Um, people also get very upset about video when it tears, when you when it doesn't sync to retrace properly. There's a scan out happening here. There's a electron beam sweeping across and lighting up an LCD inside of there, and you can if you paint something here right as the beam goes by you'll see the bottom get painted and then see the top get painted as the next beam traces through um, people get really angry about this in video way more than they do for their desktop way more than they do for 3d games so now you have to handle syncing to retrace for all the emulated video surfaces that you're constructed but you can do it it's just a lot of boring typing So then you get to direct rendering. Direct rendering is this idea where you tell, you give the, appli the X application permission to talk directly to the graphics card. And you work out some handshaking for, I'm going to own this area, or I'm going to own these, these objects full of pixels, and then please make them, you know, let's not step on each other. So now, as windows float around, you have to update where they are, and you have to communicate this to the client somehow. And now you're telling, this, telling them this additional bit of information, which is that the root window isn't just one thing, it's, it's lots of things. Um, but this actually ends up not being too bad, because OpenGL is a little bit more pleasant in this regard. Uh, basically, all you're doing is building up a display list full of commands that you're going to send to the 3D hardware, and you just hold on to it. And you do it anyway. And then as you get to a, a synchronization point in OpenGL, which is an explicit flush or swap buffers, um, or you know, where you're swapping the image you've rendered to the front and making it actually appear on the screen, um, that's sort of the implicit point where you actually dispatch the rendering to the card, and then it goes and does stuff. Um, so at that point in time, you just do it twice and change your clip in your viewport to match for each of the two blocks that you've got, uh, each of the, the shards that you're rendering against. The right. Right, so the, the observation was that in DRI2, this does get a lot easier because the list of information that you're sharing with the clients is different than it was in DRI1. So you don't have to tell it. Um, you know, you don't have to tell it where your where your window really is. You're just handing off the buffer after it's rendered. Correct. Correct. And when you and when you as you drew to the back buffer, you it would have to be done multiple times, yeah. and then you would do multiple swaps to the front. Yeah. You, you do have, you do have to tell the client about the list of shards it's rendering to, but you're going to get that in some sense from the DRM device, because the DRM is the thing that knows that's where you've got these these bits. Um, again, sync to retrace is hard. Again, there's this direct pixel API that deals with the front buffer directly that you have to do explicitly by manually walking each of the ones. And then, yeah, you knew about that. It's the same thing as put image and get image before. You can also just punt, uh, because GL lets you say, no, sorry, I can't do that. It can say, nope, sorry, my textures are only going to be this big. I can only draw to a surface that's this big, and you get to suffer. Uh, if that's not as big as you wanted, then too bad. Um, yeah. Sorry? You sh so the question is, how do the apps cope when this, hap when this happens? Where, you know, what does it do when it runs off past these limits? Um, they'll make a window that's too big and then they'll only get their rendering into the top left corner of it if they if they don't check. So this is probably a stupid question, but why do you really want to expose like one root window that is multiple shards? Wouldn't it be nicer to like most people want two separate windows and that would be two shards but with no overlap and just make it so that there's empty space in between. So you can never have the situation where if you move a window, yeah. there's this empty area where it's between two window, windows. The empty space isn't the problem. No, but so that you never have something that actually crosses between more than two. Oh, yeah, we, ha we have that mode already. That's Zaphod mode. And 
No, people don't want that. People get, I mean. <laughs> I could get to a display to work on my laptop, and I want that, and I could get it to work just because of the reason. Yeah. Maybe that was just, this is a year ago. Yeah, the, there are use cases for both. And when you're using Zaphod mode, you do get this kind of for free, although it splits it apart at a different layer of dispatch. Um, but it doesn't let you do multi-head for display walls correctly because you want big things moving around. Lots of people want expand, extended desktop and ask us why it doesn't work, why they tried to set up multi-head and got the wrong thing where windows are stuck to one piece of glass. So yeah, you want it, but thank you, 10 minutes. Um, you can want it both ways, but that means your users are going to want it both ways. So you kind of have to implement it. So this slide is entirely a lie. Uh, most of the, the complexity of this, the Core X stuff is mostly written. Render is a lot of typing. Um, one of the reasons that the, the complexity that I'm facing right now is you want this at two layers. You would like it to be both at the CRTC layer for scan out to say, no, it can only go, you know, you can only draw to this big, and you want, those can only get that big, and you want it at the EXA layer for, which is the hardware acceleration path, so that if you create an off-screen pixel map that's that big, you can render to it, um, and render to it with the hardware rather than with the CPU. Uh, you would like to be able to do that without having to write this boilerplate code in every subsystem that checks whether it's that kind of uh, shattered pix map and does the magic uh, chicanery to, to restart rendering. You'd like it to just be the kind of thing where as you're about to start rendering at all, this unified shatter subsystem says, nope, that's a shattered pix map. I'm going to go look up what the shards are now. And then all your all the DXA or render would, or render would have to do is give you the list and say, this pix map is virtual. It's got these shards backing it kind of awkward, just the way the API works out. Um, but once I've got that, I should be a little bit happier. Also, it's a complete API break. It really, really, really messes with the screen rec, which is the one structure in X that we haven't messed with too much since X for 86 4.0. So it's going to break all your proprietary drivers. I am really sorry. Well, yeah, they're going to complain. I'll just have to tell them about the joys of freedom. <laughs> so it's a work in progress. I would certainly appreciate anybody who thought, who thought this was interesting and wanted to take a hack at it, because you can get the code. Really, it exists, I promise. Um, and I'm going to be continuing to work on it for probably the next couple, uh, at least the next six months, probably going to try to get into X Server 1.7, and life will be wonderful. So I have 15 minutes left five of my actual talk time and then 10 for questions, but I'm done. So do you guys have questions? <coughs> yes? That is an excellent question. The question is, uh, I've been talking in the sense of one GPU. How, how does this work with multiple GPUs? Um, I would like to use this again to do that. So all your, pic all your windows become virtualized immediately. And as rendering comes into the top, you figure out, oh, it's on video card number one. I'm going to send rendering there. And it's not on video card number two, so I'm just going to clip away rendering. It's not going to happen there. And then as things move back and forth, it's going to be slow like it is already. But I would like to reuse this for the same thing that Zinorama currently does. Zinorama is the way we do this right now, and it does it way up at the top of dispatch. First thing as a request comes into the server and hands it off across multiple GPUs. And therefore, all, these, all the back-end GPUs still have all the problems. Uh, they, can, they still have the coordinate limits that have to work with them. So I would like to reuse this multiple dis this redispatch layer every time I get the opportunity. Almost for free. Yeah, but you are. No, the, the, no. The, the the observation there, the observations there were uh, 
that you get this almost for free because you've already done the hard work of breaking up rendering, but then you're limited to the lowest common denominator or else of what the different bits of hardware can do or else you get really weird effects. No, no, that's not true. Uh, when you get, when we do Xenorama, we ask each, essentially ask each of the backends what they're capable of, each GPU, and only expose the common subset. So nothing goes wrong. Also in the sense that the different backends, you know, one of them could be really nicely accelerated driver and one of them could be VESA, which has to do everything in software. So everything has to work in software anyway. So when the driver fails and says, nope, sorry, my 3D engine can't do that, you're just going to fall back to software. So there's no problems at the edges, I hope. Daniel. I don't know. When, did I mean 1.7? I don't know. When what? When is uh is 1.7 scheduled, Daniel? I don't know. I might be able to get it done by then. I'm a lot happier with it now than I was when I was working on this four months ago. So, James. Sorry? The old Mac OS is pretty much all that. Mm -hmm. uh, the question was, what do Windows and Mac OS do? Um, <sighs> no, they make me cry in a corner. Windows has a significantly different driver model. They basically just give you, give the driver, here's a pile of pixels and go and do this very limited thing against it. They don't expose all the complexity of GDI. They don't expose a lot of things. You basically get a buffer that you're doing some stuff with and a clip list. And that's it. So I suspect that they don't do this, though, I su because most of the complexity for this would actually be handled in the, IH in the uh, ICD, in the driver that's installed from the vendor. And most of them are probably going to be like, oh, yeah, well, if you want to do four NVIDIA cards in one machine, they got to all be NVIDIA cards. And they all have to work together. And they probably have to be within the same family generation and and and. Um, Mac OS, I think, has a little bit better grasp of reality, but I haven't looked too closely at, at what OS X does. Um, ben tells me Mac OS Classic used to do something similar. You're holding up your hand saying five minutes left, not asking a question. Okay. Are there any people who do have questions? I'm trying to figure out how to rephrase how to phrase the question. Uh, it was sort of uh, you've got the proposal that you're talking about is you have uh, a region that's actually shown and a bunch of, of area off that that isn't shown. We don't so. Then yes, we wouldn't need to do this. Um, and is that something? You know, why wouldn't the hardware vendors who now know that the problems with the GPUs is common? Why wouldn't they just start doing it? Uh, one, because multiple GPUs isn't that common. It's been broken in X since 1.5, at least, and I've had 10 people complain. Nobody does it. Uh, the people who do it are using Nvidia's driver, and Nvidia's driver has it working, but. Not simultaneously. There's a way to make them switch, but no, there aren't. There, there's no laptops that do both at once. That's a U, that's a USB device. I'm going to pretend those don't exist. makes you log out. Did you know that? Um, yeah, if I wanted to switch between graphics chips then and I wanted to log out between, man, that's easy. No, this is keeping it working when they're both up. I had heard that there was some hardware manufacturer that was thinking about future generations would have an option to run both 
parallel? It's possible. And the thing is, when you do that, all the GPUs that you're talking to are still going to have some physical limitation on what they can on what they can accelerate. Uh, the, the question that you asked earlier about what if you had this big logical rendering area, area and you could just clip away bits that didn't have that didn't matter to that, yeah, we've got that. That's not the problem. The problem is that the thing you're trying to render is bigger than the box it gives you. The box it gives you is, is implicitly clipped to two kilopixels because that's all your scan out hardware could do on my terrible old ThinkPad. So you can set the clip list. You can set the clip for rendering to be only going to fit in two kilopixels, and then anything else that goes to that chip is just going to get thrown away. Fine. Yeah, you can do that. But you want more out of the chip. You're asking for more out of the chip because you want that plus this other ex external display, and you can't fit both of them in the same box. It's the box that, that, that it gives you isn't big enough. So yes, good, good, uh, good idea, but it it's already there and it's still broken. I hope I explained that well. Are there any other questions? Uh, then I have to thank you all for coming out because this was lovely. And I can't believe you listened. Have a thing. Thank you very much, Adam. <laughs> thank you, Kristen. Thank <laughs> you.